Um, basically, what I was going to talk about it is that when Dave and I first started getting going here, uh, when uh, all of the pandemic stuff started coming down, one of the decisions we made was to do a Bible study through the book of Exodus, which I know some of you uh, followed along with, but one of the things that came through in that Bible study as we read again that foundational story, that foundational biblical story, was that there were times in the uh, nation of Israel's life where they had to be movable and portable. In fact, most of the religious things that they had going on at that time had to be able to move because they were in the wilderness. And one of the things that they did was they set up a tent and they worshiped in tents. And I also had this beautiful opportunity one summer to be on a Native American reservation where we worshiped in church except for one season when we all got together in this big tent. And this was a, a Pentecostal style church. And so they had a tent revival that was through the roof amazing. Now, the things they could do there, we cannot do here, but I think the reason they did it is similar to the reason we do this, is to remind ourselves again that what is most important is the spirit of the living God. And that our faith has to be movable. That our faith will always be on the move and changing. And in fact, that is where we're going this morning because the title of the sermon this morning, I'll just give it to you since you don't have a bulletin, is Box Breaker. Okay, because we are now journeying through the book of Mark. And we're getting to what I think is one of the most important parts of the book of Mark. And we're going to read it and we're going to discover that there is one big box that Peter has that is going to be completely obliterated by Jesus. Okay, And I can relate. I, I really can. And I think if you've been journeying with Jesus for any time, you can also relate that God takes our boxes and he blows them up. And the beauty of that is that we get to learn something wholly new about who we are and who God is. And there goes my notes, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> and also, the difficulty of that is that we have to allow for who God is to change us and to grow us and to move us, and any time we change or grow or move, it's difficult. And so we sit in the in-between in those growth moments. You know, I think some of us at the beginning of this whole thing thought, yeah, I can grow a little. I could do this for a little while. I can learn a few lessons. It would be novel if we could just have this for just a little bit and remember that time when that crazy thing happened. But what we're finding out is that this is going to be a long growth season for us. So coming to terms with that, I think we need to look to the scriptures to see how do we have this long distance type faith that allows for us to learn and grow in every season of our life and every struggle of our life when things are good, when things are bad, how do we know how to follow Jesus? And so I'm going to pray and we'll read the gospel story today. We'll go from there. So will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for so many people that have put themselves uh, at work to bring this worship service to fruition, Lord, in this way. We thank you for the technology that's made possible. We thank you for the tents and for all the effort of the church, for all the effort and decision-making of the deacons and the elders. And Lord, we just pray your shalom, your peace to wash over us now, Lord, that we would uh, experience you and know you, Lord, and to know that this is your world. And, and so we just come to you and point our hearts to you, Lord, and we say, God, would you show us the way? Would you teach through your word and move in us to comfort us and disturb us and to grow us and to make us your disciples? And 
ultimately to give us abundant life that is only possible through you, Lord Jesus. And so we come to you now and we ask that you would make us good soil, that we would receive your gospel truth this morning. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen. Now, I don't know how y'all are going to do it, but I'm going to read from the Bible. If you got one, fine. If you want to listen along, fine. If you got something at home, great. We're going to be in Mark chapter 8. I want to start at verse 27. I'm going to read all the way to verse 38. And so here, hear these words from the Gospel of Mark. It says this. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. A few things I want to point out in our gospel picture today. The first is, I hope you caught the great moment that Peter had at the beginning of the story. And one of the details that's important at the beginning of the story is it says that they were on their way to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was a place that was known for its pagan idols. And the many ways that pagan idols had been worshipped for years and years and years in Caesarea Philippi began with Baal a long, long, long time ago. And then from there, there was a worship of the god Pan. And in fact, if you go to certain places in Caesarea Philippi today, you can see niches in the rocks where idols would have been placed, where the god Pan would have been worshipped. And then after that, when Caesar came... Then Augustus was worshipped in Caesarea Philippi, and so they had what's known as Caesar worship going on in Caesarea Philippi. And so when it, where this conversation matters, because it's a conversation about who Jesus is. And we've been reading for the last eight chapters from the gospel, and we're beginning to see and hear with the disciples that Jesus has a truly unique character. And this is the point of the Gospel of Mark. The goal is to reveal truly who Jesus is in the midst of other gods. In a place where other gods are being worshipped, there's a conversation being had about Jesus' true identity. And I've said it before, but I'll say it again. that Perhaps the question that Jesus asked Peter in this story is the most important question that will ever be asked. It's a question that each one of us should be asked again today. Who do you say that I am, Jesus says. First he begins with the other question, which is, who do other people say that I am? And they offer an interesting response, right? 
these heroes of their faith, Moses and Elijah, and people that they would have seen in high regard and held as prophets. But that wasn't enough. Now, the people that were in the crowd probably held these theories, and so there's a discussion about these theories because they're working it out. They're learning, they're growing, they're asking questions and responding and trying to figure out again and again and again, who really are we with? And then Jesus asks Peter the question. And Peter, my namesake, finally, finally, he gets it right, right? We see this moment where he soars to the heavens and answers the question in the only way that God could have given him. He says, you are the Messiah. You are the saving one, the one that was predicted by the Old Testament prophets and has now come to fruition before us in our midst. And can you imagine the moment that what that would have felt like for them. I don't know if any of you are Hamilton fans and have been, have been watching Hamilton out there, but this is a historical moment. What I love about that, that play is how often they invite their audience to think about the historical moment. We're living in a historical moment right now. Peter was in the midst of a historical moment. He was in the midst of a moment where God had come to earth and is now dwelling with his people. And not only that, but he's picking Peter as his right-hand man. And Peter, speaking for the disciples, finally gets it right for once. <laughs> but I don't know if you just kept on reading. But right after he gets it completely right, and we learn from Peter the true character of who Jesus Christ is, is the Messiah, Savior of the old world, the one, only one who can save the world. In the next breath, he is in a conversation with Jesus where he's taking him to the side and saying, Jesus, it's time for your rebuke. You get a tongue lashing. Remember how I said you were the Messiah? Well, now you're already misbehaving, and I need to correct your behavior. What changed in the story? Well, there was a box. See, there was a box about who the Messiah would be. That came from the tradition and had grown over time. And the belief really was that this wasn't about suffering, that the Messiah wasn't going to suffer. What the Messiah was supposed to do was to go and vanquish and conquer and take over the kingdoms of this world. And in that time, that meant leading a military coup against the Roman Empire. That's what the Messiah would do, that's how we would really be saved, would be if we can get this boot off of our neck from this empire, and we can be the ones in charge, and then finally we can take care of our people and get what we deserve. And can you blame them? They were oppressed for generation and generation and generation. And <laughs> Peter decides... You know how I said you were the Messiah? This is the next logical step that the Messiah should take, and that's the box that Jesus needed to break. And to teach a whole new way of being. He goes from being on top to being all the way at the bottom. He represents for us humanity. Where in one moment we can have moments of soaring insight and beauty and do incredible things. And in the next moment we can be down in the dumps hurting and betraying one another. We live with this dichotomy within our hearts. The difficult truth that not one of us is spared from sin. And the beautiful gospel truth that we can also access what Abraham Lincoln once called the angels of our better natures and that we can live into a better way in the world but what it will take 
is for us to examine all of our boxes and to say, what have I put in this box that was from me and not from God? And am I allowed to give that over to Jesus so he can go kaboom and to see what can happen if we'd be willing for him to blow up our boxes for something so much better. I remember a few months back now, sitting at a meeting with the church leadership and we were discussing this one church in Seattle that had to shut down their church services because there was this weird thing called COVID-19 that was coming. And I remember thinking about the pastor of that church for one moment and thinking, man, that guy's life must be terrible. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm over here in Southern California so we don't have to deal with Washington problems. But then the next following weeks, we discovered that our box was going to be blown up. And that we were going to have to find a new way to worship. A new way to relate to one another and to God. And to say it was never attached to these things we thought it was attached to. For me, part of that was what we get to come back to today is to look into your faces. Because preachers, preachers need an audience, man. Why do you think I got into this game? <laughs> look how much work we put in just so I could see your faces. <laughs> this is a moment for me, man. <laughs> I hope you like it. But at the end of the day, those are just crutches, right? Those are just the things that we thought we needed. But Jesus speaks to us about a whole new way of being. And the reason why Peter is called Satan in this story is because he is tempting Jesus in the same way that Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness. I want to read you that little bit of the story as well. This is from Matthew chapter 4. This is just one of the temptations. It says this, Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all of their splendor. And he said, all this I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Peter wanted the same thing. He wanted the kingdoms of this world. He wanted to ride Jesus' coattails to the top of the kingdoms of this world. And so when the Messiah came and said, No, I am truly, as Isaiah predicted, the suffering servant of the world. And in fact, I'm not going up. I'm going down. I'm not taking up my sword. I'm taking up my cross. And I'm inviting my disciples to go with me on this journey to the cross. This is where we all have to see if our box needs to be broken open again and again and again. Because Jesus was not after the kingdoms of this world, and it is our temptation to go after the kingdoms of this world just like Peter wanted and we can understand the logic we might judge him now in retrospect but we feel the feelings that Peter must have felt in that moment if we're being honest but Jesus is teaching he's saying let's develop a learning community where we can make big mistakes like this like Peter's gonna make a lot of mistakes and yet he isn't kicked out he's Satan 
he's tempting Jesus to not go to the cross, but Jesus doesn't say, now you're out of the community, you got to go. No, he says, let's take this learning moment to really understand what it means to follow me. He says, I'm not after kingdoms of this world because the kingdoms of this world are going to pass away. They are temporal. They will not exist forever. And at the time when they were looking at the power of the empire, they must have thought, that's impossible. But now we can see that's true. This is what Jesus understood. But what did Jesus come for then? Well, he starts talking about our soul. He starts saying, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? Meaning that what's more important than any empire of this world is your soul, each and every person's soul. Because it will never pass away. And so Jesus isn't willing to take up the power of this world because he wants to bring the power of God in our midst that is revealing that each person is of sacred, precious value, is made in the image of God, and is so worthy of that, that God himself would come to earth and suffer and die on a cross to teach us all about how valuable we are, how precious we are. And so Peter's box goes kaboom. And they keep on going, and he needs to learn it again and again and again and again and again. We have a faith where God takes our boxes and goes kaboom. Can you think of the great heroes of our faith and their boxes? I mean, Abraham and Sarah laughed when God told them they were going to have children in their old age, and then God took that box and he went kaboom. Moses thought he was never eloquent of speech, and so he could never be a great leader of Israel because he couldn't even put two sentences together. But God said, take that box and go kaboom. Peter had about a million boxes go kaboom. He didn't get it in the story. He had to learn later, even when he took his sword out and cut a man's ear off, that Jesus wasn't here for this military revolt. He, Jesus took that man's ear and he healed it and he said, this is not our way. This isn't the way of Jesus Christ. Kaboom. Has God said kaboom to you yet? Has he broken your box open? Because I'm convinced that my Savior, he doesn't waste death. But the boxes that are broken open, they make it possible for a totally new way. That the death that we've all experienced Daily, as we lose our freedoms, like Peter talked about, as we experience the difficulties of this season of our life, that all of this death placed in our Messiah Jesus' hands will not be wasted. But it will, in fact, be the way for a new way. It will produce new wine and new life and resurrected life that we could never have had before that we could have never known if we didn't allow our boxes to go kaboom. So let me ask you again, with the voice of Jesus, as he says, who do you say that I am? May we ride or die with Jesus in every step of the way, whether it's online or in tents, or with fog machines, whatever it is. <laughs> he doesn't change. And he is the one worthy of putting our hope and trust in again this morning. And so I pray 
that you would be encouraged. That all of this is just so you can answer that question again and again and to say, yeah, this week again, you are my Savior. This is my Father's world. And so I can trust that He has it. And I can surrender control to Him. Say, Lord Jesus, I don't know, but you do. And I know who you are, so I can trust him. Let us pray together. Lord God, show us who you are again this morning. Lord, it's hard to grow. It's hard to be pruned. It's hard to, again, realize the way that we fall short. But, Lord, we acknowledge that we live with sin. We live with brokenness. And we come to learn and grow and to know more of your grace, to feel your grace upon our lack, to feel your grace upon our frustration, to feel your grace upon the ways we've fallen short with one another, Lord. And to understand, Lord, that you are a good God. You are the God who takes care of it all. And Lord, as your disciple this morning, I want to say again, I don't understand it at all. But if you're telling me it means I take up my cross, Lord, then I stand in faithfulness with you, knowing that you are the only way. And you know how to bring shalom into the earth. And so we pray, Lord, that you would guide us and call us in that next step. In your precious and holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.